Welcome to our podcast series of Coffee with Accord, where we discuss various peace and security related topics, including ongoing and emerging conflicts in Africa, policy developments, evolving theories, and innovative approaches to peace and security. Our guests are conflict resolution practitioners, experienced mediators, and policymakers within the peace and security landscape. Enjoy this episode and feel free to leave your comments. Coffee with Accord is published by the African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes. The views and opinions expressed in this production do not reflect the views of Accord and its affiliates. Good day and warm welcome to Coffee with Accord. My name is Friederike Savatier. In this episode, we will interview His Excellency Ambassador Said Jinnit, former Special Envoy of the UN Secretary General for the Great Lakes Region, the first Commissioner for Peace and Security at the AU, and the last OAU Assistant Secretary General for Political Affairs. This episode will be about unconstitutional changes of government and how the Continental Policy Framework deals with this issue. This episode is inspired by the Policy Practice Brief, the case for updating the African Union policy on unconstitutional changes of government, written by Ambassador Janet himself, and which you will find under the research section of Accord's website. Before we get started, please grab a coffee, sit back, relax, and enjoy this short animated snippet, which will contextualize today's discussion for you. Welcome back. Thank you so much, Ambassador Jeanette, for being here today with us. It's really an honor to interview you. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Ambassador, can you please paint a picture for us of what the general consensus on the parts of various heads of state was towards developing a framework policy on unconstitutional changes of government in June 1997, when the OIU Council of Ministers met in Harare in Zimbabwe? Well, first, thank you for, for the opportunity, and I'm very pleased to see you there. Uh, with respect to your uh, question, I will start by saying that, in fact, the, uh, the Organization of African Unity became involved in, on issues of uh, unconstitutional changes of government starting the early uh, 90s. There was first the coup d'etat and assassination of President Ndadaye in Burundi in October 1993. Then there was the coup d'etat in Comoros in September 1995. Therefore, when the coup d'etat took place in Sierra Leone in 1997, there was already a realization within the, Afri within the OEU at that time that a new trend of coup d'etats was emerging and the OEU had to take position on this. I will add the following points. First, ECOWAS including uh, one of its key members, which is Nigeria, 
did not accept the coup d'etat that took place in, uh, in Sierra Leone, and that has influenced the position of the council meeting in Harare, uh, as well as the summit meeting in Harare as well. Second, the ECOWAS, with the support of the Organization of African Unity and the United Nations, have deployed so much efforts to end the conflict in Sierra Leone. These efforts have culminated in the adoption of the Abidjan Agreement. The expectation at that time was for all parties to implement the Abidjan Agreement, and yet a coup d'etat has occurred. So there was a disappointment that despite the efforts by the region, the OAU and the UN, the coup d'etat took place. Third, the coup d'etat took place a few weeks before the OAU summit in Harare, and therefore the leaders felt the need to react to that coup d'etat. All that justified why there was a reaction by the OAU summit in Harare. And fourth, and lastly, the coup d'etat that took place in, uh, in Sierra Leone took place on 25th May 1997, which is the Africa Day. So it was felt by Africans as a provocation. So all this combination has made, has contributed to the fact that there was a strong reaction in Harare, to answer your question. So I see that uh, there were a lot of uh, triggering events that uh, led to, to this meeting and then made it like really the opportunity to, to act on what was happening. Um, I would like to follow up and ask you if you could briefly give us a short definition of the term unconstitutional changes of government. Well, for me, an unconstitutional changes of or change of government means a taking over uh, power by force or malice uh, outside the electoral framework provided by the constitution or outside the political process leading to a consensual political dispensation or transition. I include in this the manipulation of the constitution by incumbent, incumbent president to remain in power. Okay, so could you then, uh, following up on this question, because I feel like there's a subtlety here, could you briefly uh, speak to the intersection between constitutional amendments and constitutional manipulation? What do you think is the fundamental tenet that separates these two concepts? Well, uh, well I, I do... Uh... I do uh, agree with you that it's a subtle uh, difference there, uh, and it has to do with the political interpretation of what is being done. So in uh, my view, constitutions are the fundamental laws of the states adopted by the people, either through a referendum or through their elected representatives. The, constitution, the constitutions are usually very stable documents which traverse the life of a nation for a long time. They are not mm. meant to be changed very often. They can, however, be changed from time to time, including uh, to be updated and match with international norms. That is understandable. But the revision of constitution should not obey the sole motivation of the incumbent president to seek a new series of terms in office. This is what we call the manipulation of, of the Constitution to remain in power, which should not be tolerated in my view. I, uh, I have elaborated a little bit on this, uh, on this issue in my paper and have uh, mm -hmm. expressed the background because uh, I have explained that uh, when we, uh, we adopted this uh, framework document in the early 2000s, the, the mood in Africa is that we should uh, have limitation in terms, uh, in terms of uh, the, the terms in office. Uh, and yeah. I have given the example of the African Union Commission. Uh, you, you, I, I reminded the, uh, us of the fact that under the OAU, the positions of Assistant Secretary General, which I held, were not limited. I, I could have had a number of uh, elect, uh, terms of in office as long as you are elected. But when we have established the African Union, we introduced the limits in terms of office of the commissioners for to two. That means you can, as a commissioner, as chairman of the commission, as commissioner, you can uh, you can be elected only twice, and then after that, mm. somebody else should come by all by all means. Okay. And uh, 
while we understood that we should not limit the choice of the people, we thought that we should protect the, the young democracy in Africa, to nurture it, mm. to protect it from the tendency to uh, autocracy and the totalitarian uh, regime that we, we had in the past. That's way of protecting democracy. We thought that we should uh, provide some limitation of, uh, in terms of office. That was approved by the AU summit in Durban, but it was never uh, implemented uh, at level of heads of state. Some have made it, some not. So I think uh, uh, the time has come for this, uh, this uh, idea to be revisited by the African Union. So you think that uh, mandate sh uh, should be limited? Yes, I, I really think that the mandates uh, should be limited to two, uh, at least. I okay. think that was what is commonly uh, agreed. They should be limited to two. Uh, again, it's not to limit the choice of the people. It's just to, for the time to allow democracy to, uh, to develop in, in Africa, to, okay. uh, to deepen. Uh, to be strengthened. And so following up on, on that point, what do you think is the role of the AU? How can the AU address the issue of constitutional manipulation while respecting a state's uh, sovereign right to amend their constitution through the prescribed democratic process? Well, again, it's a matter of interpretation. We have seen, uh, I mean, as I said, I mean, no, the AU cannot stand and stop any people from changing its constitution from time to time when the people mm -hmm. or the leadership feel that it needs to be updated, changed to be, especially when it, it has to do with the updating it to match with the current uh, international norms. You know, yes. you have to demonstrate international law in your law. So when you have missed some mm -hmm. points and then, for example, there are constitutions that have not provided for the limitation of, of, of mandates. If you change to limit the mandate, it, it makes sense. But it should not be, uh, the, the constitution should be changed, should not be changed only for the sole motivation for the president. And we have seen this in a number of situations in Africa and elsewhere in the world. When they change the constitution uh, under the pretext of updating it, it, but in fact, the real motivation was to give a new departure for the president and to seek a new series of, uh, of mandates. That is not, should not be acceptable. I see. Uh, absolutely. I, I agree. Now, um, Ambassador, I would like to jump, to go back a little bit in time and ask you about your experience. So during your, your deployment uh, to Comoros in 1995, following the September coup, what were some of the most uh, mo memorable occasion in, in that process? Well, to be, to be honest, I mean, I would have, I would, I would tell you a lot of stories about that, uh, that <laughs> process. I mean, it's, it's full of stories, but uh, I, will, I will limit myself to one of two. I mean, I think it, it I, I had an occasion, I think, of saying this story. The most memorable occasion uh, was when I had to travel to Réunion, uh, the Réunion, which is mm -hmm. a French island in the Indian Ocean, to meet President Johar. Uh, which was the president of Comoros and after the coup d'etat, he was deported uh, there to the reunion by the French following the coup d'etat. After the coup d'etat, the military, uh, the French uh, troops intervened to, uh, and then they took the president to the reunion and they have established the former prime, uh, prime minister as the interim uh, president. Uh, you should just know about the context. It was during the end of the year holidays when there was a severe cyclone in the region. Uh, the atmosphere mm. was very special. The president was accommodated in a house situated at the, uh, on the top of the mountain in the Réunion. You know that it's a mo very mountainous uh, yeah. island. Mm -hmm. The trip was very special and we had to climb a very tortuous uh, road while we were surrounded by countless waterfalls. It was as impressive as scary. I can tell you, as I was climbing there, I, I thought of, I thought myself, I said this one day I want to write a book about, uh, you know, this kind of uh, book like uh, 
uh, on a very uh, scaring uh, atmosphere, you should come there and write mm. the book there because it's the right, the right atmosphere. Then when we arrived at the top of the mountain, and as we were approaching the, the house, we saw the poor president standing at the door. He was dressed mm -hmm. in a very light white dress. Uh, oh. We greeted him and we sat down for discussions. It took me some time to persuade him that I was coming on behalf of the Organization of African Unity. He thought mm -hmm. that I was part of the French intelligence who came there to take him out of the reunion in an attempt mm -hmm. to exonerate the French government from any responsibility in his uh, deportation to the Réunion Island. So it took me some time to convince him that I am the chief of staff of the then Secretary General of the OAU that I am. It took him time to believe that we were an African Union, or an OAU rather, genuine uh, uh, delegation. He finally understood that we were a genuine African team charged with restoring constitutional order in, uh, in, uh, in Comoros. The second thing that impressed me was his attitude. The, the attitude of the president. He was a rather old man, isolated mm -hmm. and vulnerable in that very uh, scary atmosphere in the cyclone uh, period in, uh, at, the, at the top of the mountain in the reunion. And he was by himself alone. He told us that he was deported as he was dressed up without any other additional cloth. He may be, it might be true, but it's what he told us. I mean, to feel that he was really uh, treated badly by the, by the French. Uh, he added that the French can do whatever they can with his body. And he was a very small, uh, uh, small man. Uh, but what he had in his head, they can do nothing about it. I was quite impressed by that attitude of very vulnerable man, old man, says, you know, I'm vulnerable. They brought me here. They can do whatever they can do with my body. But what I have in my mind, they can never do. They can do nothing about it. So that's yes. a small story I have about. But I have many other <laughs> stories. I'll give them for another opportunity. Yes. You, you cannot take the, the freedom away as well. You can do what you want with the body, but you cannot take the freedom away. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. Ambassador, so you have spoken to the political shift which propelled the development of a policy framework on, on constitutional changes of government. But what were some of the issues which caused a resistance initially? Because I imagine it must have not been such an easy process. Well, adopting policy framework uh, on the unconstitutional changes of government was one of the battles we had in, uh, during the uh, transformation of the Organization of African Unity and the establishment of the African Union. And uh, not all member states were on, on board on the same wavelength to be honest. But for mm. every battle that we undertook during the transformation of the OAU and the establishment of the AU and its peace, security and governance agenda, we managed to mobilize sufficient support within member states and minimize the resistance of those opposed to the initiative. That's the way we have been working, you know. You have to identify the forces within the, your constituency and you work with those in support, you mobilize them, to constitute a strong force for change and you minimize as much as possible the, the, uh, the uh, resistance of those opposed to the initiative. That's the, 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 the tool we used to make the, to affect the changes and it has worked. Yet in the implementation of the various policies, we have been confronted by resistance by some member states who wanted to mm -hmm. change the policy as it fits their immediate interest, national narrow interests. That's part of life, you understand? Yes, in yes, my paper, is. I gave the example of the decision to suspend Comoros from the OAU, which a group of member states wanted to change in 2001 during the Council of Ministers in Lusaka. I mm. had, as the then Assistant Secretary General Port Lafayette, to stand firmly and remind member states of their policy and the chairman of the meeting uh, ruled out the proposal of the group of states. I mean, because after my strong uh, plea, he saw merit in, uh, in, in the organization, keeping and uh, living up to its own commitment. And he ruled out the group of heads of, of uh, ministers who spoke and uh, wanted to change the decision. And the decision remained as, as it was after my, uh, my, my, uh, my presentation. This is why I always say 
uh, and I said clearly that in, 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 in my paper, that I always believe that the most important role of the EU Commission, and I played, I know what it meant when I was there, is mm. lies in capacity to make proposals, to implement decisions, and more importantly, maybe, to act as the custodian of the decisions of the policy organs in the face of attempts by individual member states or group of states to renege on previous commitments for reasons of national interest or political expediency. Because in life, yes, yes you could have a collective decision and one or many other uh, states from time to time for their own national interest, they may want to change the decision it's up to the people who are paid and elected to represent the collective uh, memory of the organization to remind member states that we should co build on continue building and should not take decision and change it and take decision and change it this is not the best way for making progress for an organization like the oeu and the african union yes we we must uh, hold each other accountable so Absolutely. Following up on that, yes, I, I, I would like to ask you, Ambassador, to, to finish, what is the one recommendation uh, that you have for the, Afri um, the African Union uh, regarding the update of the policy framework on unconstitutional changes of government? Well, I think, uh, well, in my recent paper, I suggested that the Lome Declaration uh, should be revisited or the... Uh, the, uh, the, uh, the chapter on uh, democracy and governance, whatever, whatever instrument mm -hmm. they, they, they choose to, to revise, to review, and update based on the lessons drawn from the past and more recent experiences. It is high time, in my view, that the manipulation of constitutions uh, to remain in power be included in the revised policy as constituting, constituting an unconstitutional change of government. I also believe that the decision, as I said earlier, on the limitation in terms of office, as endorsed by the EU Assembly in Durban in 2002, should also be given effect. So these are not only one, but two recommendations, taking the, uh, on board the manipulation of constitutions as an unconstitutional change of government when incumbent president changed the constitution with the sole motivation of remaining in power, I think that was envisaged initially in our draft in 2000 as an constitutional change in government. Unfortunately, it was removed in, uh, in Lome by uh, the group of ambassadors. I think it's high time to reinsert it in the draft policy, in the policy document, where uh, what is re 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 reviewing the, the, the Lome declaration of the Charter on Democracy, that this needs to be included as one of the... Uh, in uh, constitutive acts of uh, a constant change of government. Thank you so much, uh, Ambassador. That gives us really a lot to think about and to act upon. So, unfortunately, that is all the time we have today. Thank you so much, Ambassador, for giving us your time today uh, to participate in this discussion, which has been very interesting and very insightful, to say the very least. Thank you, the audience, for watching this episode of Coffee with Accord. Until next time, I have been Friederike Sabatier. Have a good day. Take care. Au revoir. Thank you for watching today's episode of Coffee with Accord. Do not forget to subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you can receive notifications every time we post a new episode. For more updates, like our Facebook page, African Center for the Constructive Resolution of Disputes, or follow us on Twitter or on Instagram at Accord Online. To learn more about Accord, visit our website www.accord.org.za.